there are no parties. So there is FDA, there is the CE marking from EU, uh, then, then it's the wild, wild west. So different countries have their own. So Africa has the Africa CDC now that they're trying to put together a pan-Africa regulatory body, but that doesn't exist. Kenya has their own version of uh, drug control and uh, poison control. And you can already see from the name of that regulatory body, they have figured out how to do that for drugs, but medical devices don't fit in that bill. So they are just building their capacity to do this for regulatory devices. India has a framework from ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, but they usually many entities, if there is an FDA approval, or a CE mark with the EU approval, they just accept that because sometimes the internal infrastructure is not there. The problem is that if you are not serving the American market, the malaria market in the US is very low, although there is traveler's malaria, lots of people go and come back. Uh, it may not be a priority for the FDA. So, or you might not be able to raise the kind of capital that's needed to go through the ringers that are needed here. And so this is kind of a chicken and egg problem that currently, even in a global South type of a context, you have to go through the FDA, but it's a federal penalty if you are, because FDA is paid by the taxpayer's money, the entity that's getting an FDA approval needs to demonstrate and show that they are actually building tools for the American public. So it's a little bit complicated in terms of thinking about that. You can't just get that approval and say that we won't be in the American market. This is a question in your questionnaire. And it's actually unfortunate. And a lot of COVID work got hampered quite a lot in that context. I mean, again, COVID, yes, the need was everywhere, but there are certain types of solutions that were needed for oxygen that didn't make sense for here, but made a lot of sense in places where the oxygen pipeline was breaking down but they couldn't get approvals fast enough. And then again, if there was no approval, then adoption in a given country. And again, you know, for good reasons, because many of the governing bodies don't have the technical teams associated with it. So that's a long winded answer that, you know, in research, of course, with our research partners that we ship these machines to, they modify. And one of the big things that we are excited about going back to a little bit of the project that you guys are doing, the firmware is really where, the lot more number of people will engage. The goal is to build a, a stabilized, good standard hardware that then lots of people can build the firmware that, that the TB layer that's running on the compute that does TB diagnostic is just different from malaria, but how it actually detects malaria or the, the hardware part of it remains very similar. So think of it as an iPhone uh, we want to build, this is still a dream, but we want to build the equivalent of an iPhone for imaging-based platform for diagnostics. You can write an app for TB, somebody else can write for malaria, somebody else can write for, say, head and neck cancer. And as long as you get that approved and you've shown clinical validity, we will open that up on this platform. That's kind of the goal. And again, you know, to do any of that, we need data. And that's why we need these machines to work and operate in the field. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to just assemble this quickly to show you guys it in operation because that's fun. And then I'll just point out a few sets of things along the way. Uh, the reason this is boxed versus unboxed is because this gets put in a lot of environments with dust and the dust kills everything. Anything mechanical that you make gets killed in dust. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of things because we are now doing optical alignment. Uh, these are uh, a very common feature. These are kind of double pins. They help a lot in the alignment. And you can see in the machine sense, there are these two little threads. And so when I mount it, uh, it latches and locks in in place because uh, right there. So now I don't have to worry about alignment. This is similar to, you know, another better version of this would have been the kinematic alignment, the kind of alignment that I showed that was operating in Lego and then a version of that. So this just gives you, it doesn't give you perfect, but because we will be dealing with, you know, a high magnification objective with something that, uh, where did the tool go? Uh, oh, no worries. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, the yeah. Let me know whenever you don't need it. Uh, so this is one of the key is the fact that uh, you could always over engineer a given instrument and the, the kind of the trick in assembly in terms of this figuring out would be is what is good enough. Uh, and so I think in this scenario, there are lots of 3D printed microscopes out there, but they work. Uh, the difference is that you want this to work for five to 10 years. You want it to just be operational every single day, and then it's worth it in terms of the cost. And actually we went through that same process in a few minutes when I go back to the lab, I will bring the very first 3D printed version that we made out of DVD player parts. And you guys will see the real difference between how far it's come. I mean, it's six years of work in that scenario. And there is a fine line we're trying to cut. We're trying not to over-engineer it, but you also have to realize that you're making products. And if you're making products, prototypes are not good enough. I mean, that was good enough to write a paper, but it's not good enough to be left for many months collecting data, which is where we are, because we need to collect a lot more data uh, in terms of the machine learning algorithms. Um, so, uh, I think just in the logistics side, um, it's going to take me a little time if I open this up, but there's basically an XY stage, very much like the stage that you guys see over there, except that stage has actuators dangling out, while this one has actuators uh, folded in in a manner that it gives you this footprint. And it's actually very interesting to even think about. So when you look at this thing coming out, it can take two glass slides. So it can image two slides at a time. And just to scan this much area, most XY scanners need this much space because you need to reach the farthest corner and then the other far corner. And this is kind of just a, uh, just the nature of just where the footprint, I mean, why this footprint? I would love for this footprint to be half, but it's some space that we have at the back here for getting the driver boards to be inside. And so I think, you know, it's not as if this is, but from a compactness point of view, I think, you know, that's really the, and the first ones that we made were much, much smaller, but again, the motors were not that robust. So the other thing that we're going to do is uh, when we are assembling, and I think this you will see in there, there is a lot more manual alignment for that one, while this is something where much of the alignment happens because of the features that are in here. Um, Should I type in this? No, I think this is good. Yeah, it's good enough. Um, so I have a little uh, ring here and a ring here and a set screw, and this is essentially good enough in the context of alignment. Uh, and kind of one of the, uh, clearly what you're seeing is not something from scratch. So uh, the goal of just this exercise is to give you just a little flavor. Uh, yeah, starting to point this more up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, clearly, we're not assembling everything from scratch. Uh, so first of all, you already noticed that, so this is spring-loaded, and the, the Z actuator is right there. Um, and so there has to be one actuator that sits on, the XY is handled with that, the Z, for the microscope this handle right here. Um, and at this point, basically the assembly part is done. Uh, this currently has too many, let's find a power strip. So if one of you can find a power strip and give me power here. Oh, I see. Uh, oh, this one, right? Why don't we, no, there is one, but I want like. Oh, something like that. There are yeah. But yeah, but I think that's for we need one for that. That's kind of ironic to be in a lab and not uh, not have extension cords. Let's look around. I think 
I, I bet they are just in one of the. Uh, I think there was one. Oh, do you black, see it? Black one. Yeah. Connected to the outlet. So. Yeah. yeah. Can you just bring one extension cord as long as you're not removing something important? Or... So you use uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, yeah, like a microcontroller for this device. So the what original the one. No, we just call them uh, Octopi because they all started with Raspberry Pis. Okay. Right now, we're going to be using uh, a laptop uh, for all of the compute purposes. And, and what microcontroller control these motors? Uh, yeah, I'll show it to you. So I think there is an Arduino right okay, here. Okay. And there is a custom uh, motor stack that mm -hmm. we have that you'll see that's open on the other one. So when we jump from here to there, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. That just has most of the edge bridges. Yeah. The, the thing that's valuable is uh, we've tried Raspberry Pis for doing the compute side of the story because this is not a telehealth type of a solution. The goal for this is to be able to detect and identify things uh, real time. And so there is a compute layer to it. So raspberries are a little bit slow. The Jetson Nanos is the one that we've gotten that working on, and that's good enough. Uh, laptops definitely are uh, superior. And I think, you know, one of the threads there is that cell phones might lie right in the middle in that price point versus compute. Uh, so I think, you know, from a compute point of view, uh, all the data, so it will collect around, when we get this started, it'll collect around 10 gigs of data per patient. Oh, yeah. You don't need it because most of the time it's just dark pixels, like there is nothing there, parasites are only rare. So immediately you can just throw that away. We don't throw that data right now because for research purposes, uh, we want to still, uh, uh, we want to still use and extract as much information out of those types of things. But technically, uh, you don't actually need to store any of that data. Uh, so these are little joysticks that we've been making. Uh, in the past, we've also played with using uh, the the gaming controllers. Uh, they significantly reduce the cost for us. Uh, so I think I am kind of excited about switching completely to those gaming controllers uh, because they're all mass manufactured. So as long as you keep playing games, uh, it will be okay. Uh, and I think it's it's actually quite uh, they work very well uh, in terms of ergonomics and everything. And um, you can see the difference between. The controller that was that controller box that we just made that, but now we've uh, kind of built this around to make sure that again no dust in the parts that uh, operate the controller itself. It's just like so funny. It is funny to see the latency. Look <laughs> the the orientation. Oh, <laughs> figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, it's yeah. The mirror. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just connect that to Chat GPT, and then we have what is that mirror in Snow White? You know, the, yeah, there's yeah. a mirror in Snow White oh, that yeah. will tell you everything about the future. <laughs> I bet there is somebody working on that. That would be funny. That would be really great. Yeah, like give you a, a dose of morning reality. You wake up, the mirror starts talking to you. <laughs> mirror, mirror, can you write me a reversive, uh, can you write me a recursive function? Yeah, <laughs> mirror, mirror. I like that, actually. <laughs> Because that's how they talk to it, right? Mirror, mirror. I have no idea. I, I feel like that would make sense. Yeah. Mirror, mirror on the wall. So well, I think we have something here. It would actually, it's not, it would be fun. I think, I think it would make sense. It's yeah. a creepy yeah. yeah. fun. Well, <laughs> by the way, like everybody is writing chat GPT applications. So, so, 
Oh, oh we could make it evil. Like it already is evil. Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, it's a phase, right? So like, if, you, if you plug chat GPT, we give chat GPT a phase. Um, okay, I think maybe I'll flip things around that way. Let's see if you guys can come on this yeah, side. Yeah, you might give a recursive function. Um, and I think, yeah, the this is the reason this is still in prototype phases. All of these cables, as you can see, are a pain. Um, we currently make that's plugged in, right? Mm -hmm. This is uh, just the motor. That's correct. But I'm seeing. Well, I'd say that's all, but it would be a lot. X is there. Oh, I think it's I'm trying to build something in that just to look at. X, Y is here. Power powers there. And then now what's missing is no, so my camera yeah, and the Arduino power cable. Is there another cable that's fell? Um, Ellie, do you have a Arduino cable? Another one, the USB. Okay, I, think oh, I might have not. Um, did you? You guys powered this last night, right? Not this. Uh, I no, I don't. I don't even... Yeah, I was gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I have to just bring one Arduino cable. Uh, yeah, do you want to? You have my card, right? And then let me just power up the laptop for a second. Oh, sorry, I have it. Yeah, I was using it to hold my. Uh, actually, no, maybe I spoke too soon. Um, yeah, no, I think I just need that one of the Arduino cables. Uh, Okay, that's gonna do that in a second. Um, okay, so I think yeah, a couple of things to sort of uh, play with and think about is uh, between this system and the other system, uh, the goal really is that you know currently it's using several of these cages for the Tor Labs parts. But after that, this is almost all parts are custom. While in that system, one of the goals is for it to be as open ended. So, say the application that the soup screen folks are now working on, the idea would be is you can already see that, oh, I need to get a plate in there autonomously. I need to remove a plate autonomously. And so you can start thinking about that everything at the bottom remains the same and everything in the top. And then the other thing that you don't see in that instrument, for example, is like, oh, there's no fluid handling yet. So then that would be the other thing to think about, which is, uh, I think everybody's seen open trons, right? Maybe if not, let's just, while we're waiting, let me just show you guys open trons. Watch, watch, watch. Yeah, let's go this way so that we don't, uh, I had a few things. Uh, this is ever an important, Interesting in terms of the automation side of the story. So let's just come in here to help that. You guys can come a little bit closer if you want. And this started just as a small project, but then in COVID, this ramped up to be, um, you know, 
multi million dollar company they because they ended up using these and installing these for automating a lot of PCR uh, oh. and uh, COVID assays. Mm -hmm. And so just because it was painful to be pipetting and so they wanted to remove something like that. So that as a company, then they became quite big. Uh, but the threat is you can operate them through Jupyter Notebooks. And I think it's valuable when you just, when you look at something like this, you should just identify all the common parts. There's not that much difference between this and a 3D printer. Like most people build 3D printers to begin with, I can already see the motor driver right there. There's actually, uh, in terms of the driver, right? It's kind of scary. This is mine. We are the only one who's been using this for a while. Uh, but you can see a Raspberry Pi right there. As you guys see that? And so that's their controller. Uh, yeah, you have to come up close, but right here. Uh, uh, and effectively, the yeah, no, I think I don't want anything to fall into it. Uh, so anyway, 96 well plates. Uh, and so one of the threads to think about is uh, uh, even this might be too much of a, a kind of an instrumentation. And so what is the minimal version of pipetting that can be implemented directly on imaging? Because this alone is not sufficient for any assay. I mean, yes, it will make all the plates. Now what? You still have to do something with the plates. So there is one miniature robot that we have been working on that snaps directly onto the squid platform. And that's something that another group had been working on for a long time, a fairly small footprint pipetting robot. Uh, and so then you can suddenly see the combination of these types of tools is what gives rise to an assay that you care about. And I think in general, uh, it's valuable for you guys to read through if you're serious about sort of bio instrumentation, see all the things that people have built because a combination of those is what a new function essentially is. And, you know, this is a very useful function. It's still a, it's a little still too bulky, uh, but I think, you know, from a cost point of view, they definitely are, um, you know, I think maybe this one, maybe our 10K or something like that. And it's definitely a big jump from what it used to be. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, it's not that hard to build many of these types of systems. Uh, and then related to this, another project that uh, we thought about last year, but I don't think anybody picked up uh, and I didn't bring up this year, but it's worth mentioning is the pipettes themselves. So... <laughs> And uh, you might not realize it, but these little pipettes that are hanging out right on that other side, we can go out. How much do you think these things cost? You guys want to guess? Huh? Huh? 300? Which one would it look like? Yeah. Every one of these little things right too, here. Too much. Too much. <laughs> yeah. So a thousand dollars or something. Oh, wow. wow. More. But then you also pay for calibration of them. Every wow. Year. So that is another couple hundred dollars. This is a big one. Somebody literally comes to the lab across all labs around the world, sits there, and does something for calibration. <laughs> and I have no choice but to pay because when you're writing papers, and you know you want your results to be repeatable. You want to make sure that your pipettes were calibrated. But <laughs> what you pipetted is exactly what you uh, had. Uh, yeah. So I think I mean in general, this is uh, that's a pretty important uh, thing to target as uh, getting uh, uh, building pipettes that that actually are. I mean, you know, sometimes. Uh, and again, the original patent for a pipette uh, is actually fairly old. And it's not that they have dramatically changed in any way. And it's, it is about time for somebody to actually tackle that directly. And in a clinical setting, would you have to get those uh, done by, by like a professional calibrator because of regular reasons? I think reasons? currently they don't, they don't guarantee their, if you try to do that, they, 
you just lose your uh, warranty, basically. Okay. And so it's it really they it's fascinating that they've built a subscription fee model by making a design that falls out of calibration over time. <laughs> and it's just I mean you know I've never questioned it. Um, now this even car works with uh, subscription model. model. Yeah. yeah. Um, is this a new password? I see. Uh, yeah. I think that would you be fantastic. You put a car with everything inside it, but you have to pay every <laughs> month to get access to this function, like uh, features like yeah. Uh, uh, BMW like works with this like from year, last last year, I think. Yeah. I think also car dealer cars like the car companies make most of their money from maintenance, right? Yeah. It's not actually like the car itself. Yeah, parts basically. Yeah. yeah. It's that interesting that if you like a uh, buy every like a. Uh, parts separately and then build the car it costs like a 10, 000, 10 times expensive more expensive <laughs> yeah and the pipettes there's so many different sizes so you have to get like one of each to do <laughs> like yeah no no size. absolutely yeah. and those pipettes just uh, manual or is one you have to, what what what's the difference between them and other like a... no they are manual there's no electricity or anything there is also electronic uh, pipettes out there too. Uh, so at this point, I'm open up. So if you guys want to come in here, uh, this is all just primarily written in Python. And one of the things, this is the older version actually. I'm just going to check whether um, I have the newer version. I probably don't have the newer version. Um, so the first thing we will do is to see whether our LEDs are turning on and off. So I have, uh, and then you can see the light turned on, so it's live. Uh, I need to first go to signal. So this one is kind of a research version implying that you can do all kinds of crazy multi-acquisition. So I could program it arbitrarily. There is one front that we have that's a very malaria focused front. So then the, there's not that many buttons other than just saying, oh, here is a second that just get started. Uh, so, uh, and then the other thing that I'm just going to do is to get to instead of, I think usually we have a load button for it, but um, let's just do that manually. Um, got to load a slide. Uh, so usually what this does is it load, uh, let's see, is there a slide somewhere? Yeah. On that, uh, so we'll just start with something random, but uh, I'll also just go bring a malaria slide because you guys may not have seen uh, the packaging slide. So actually, uh, Ellie just went to the lab, right? Yeah. yeah. Can you just ask her to pick up a, a malaria slide? Yeah. It doesn't have to be patented. Just any blood smear would actually do the trick. Uh, uh, this part is still manual in terms of just how kind of the user puts in and mounts the slides. Uh, yeah, and then I'll find and change the, for a second, the version for doing that on the... Uh, so you wanted to apply the machine learning to uh, automatically uh, adjust? 
or no that is already done it's it's the older version i think we just changed the laptop i have to find that new version for the code uh the loading and things are pretty straightforward i think it's just the um because depending on a smear versus uh, a smear, there is a sample everywhere while uh, I've just put something in here. So actually, why am I doing that when I have a wonderful little right there? Can't see what this is. I uh, so I can already see that the sample and I'm now gonna focus. Uh, you can see that's going out of focus. That's going in focus. Uh, there we go. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, and so then this one we have designed where there is a little bit of a, a kind of like rheostats um, where I can choose the speed, for example how I want to work. So if this was a patient sample, say a cancer patient sample at this point, uh, this would scan this entire thing. Uh, I would walk away and then all you have is digital data. Uh, and so I'm going to adjust the illumination. Uh, and then I think there's a couple of optical tricks that we play. And then after this, we'll switch to fluorescence. Um, uh, in optics, there is this thread of, you know, when you notice, for example, some of the subtle features that you might see here, I'm going to switch the illumination. So this is the way we're illuminating is essentially an array of LEDs rather than a single LED. And then we can take that same array of LED and only illuminate half of it. That's what it means to say LED matrix left and right. And what it does is it does what it's called pseudo phase, where the light only comes from one half. And because of that, there is an equivalent version of it where the sets of contrast you see if everything is illuminated as compared to the contrast that you see uh, when the array is illuminated. So when I do half, you notice that the intensity went down, which makes sense because now I have half of that light but I can in increase the total intensity. Uh, but in here, uh, the, the types of things that you are seeing, for example, are would not be visible in features. And this will become very clear when we do the, uh, the blood sample slide. Um, uh, because with that slide, uh, there's all kinds of things that will just become visible. So while we're baiting, uh, this is going to be live cells for that, but maybe I'll do kind of a fun, let's do a cheek swab. Uh, so check that out. I want to show you guys sort of contrast that comes by label three. So, and I think, you know, anything that you can see, what label three just means. Uh, you haven't stained it. And you can still observe things inside a cell uh, because it still has a refractive index of different. So I'm hoping I wash my hands. So I'm going to do something gross. Uh, I'm sure you guys have done this in high school, right? No? You guys don't do that? No? I thought this is like a standard in all high schools where you do. Or it's like, like, have I done this to myself or like, have I seen someone do this? For someone. <laughs> so at this point, what I should do is uh, wash my hand or not. Uh, power slip, which I don't think I have here, right? It's going to dry. It's okay. We'll just test it. I think, uh, you know, this is interesting. I've been thinking about cheek swabs for all kinds of reasons. See how non invasive that is. It's pretty. If I can extract some patient information out of that, that's actually very interesting to begin with. But we're going to now kind of, what is fun in microscopy is to do things where you don't know what you're about to see. Like you all experience that a little bit 
when we were out in the field. So I know. Yeah, I think basically anything with blood would do the trip. So, yeah, okay. So I know there's something there. I'm going to play around to focus it. Uh, this is the right direction. Uh, currently, the newer version of Octopi, it does a complete autofocus. So right there. And now this is really fun because we can look for bacteria in my mouth. Which is the whole universe a, in your mouth. <laughs> right there. Wow. Those are... Those are live bacteria oh. and all of them right there. Whoa. And you can see this is a rod-like bacteria. Do you guys see that? Uh, of course, these are cheek cells. Uh, the, and this is, is a it... type of an epithelium. I hope that's not a, uh, I'm not expecting protists or other things. You can see that's the nucleus right there. Often enough, you see a, a little bump. That's a nucleus? Yeah. Is it possible to see the screen? So that's nucleus. And again, this is all without any stain. It's all live. Oh, uh, what the? Oh, oh. It's an air bubble. <laughs> see something so perfect. <laughs> perfect surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, but I, I think what I'm right. most excited about is the bacterial content. So let's just focus on that to see if we can characterize something. Those cells look kind of more layered than the other. So their layer comes from the epithelium. The definition, the word epithelium means it's layered because they are forming lines after lines after lines. When I was rubbing with my hand, what we were able to get is when you're getting cheat cells, if you're actually getting a little pieces of your cheek. I you literally that? got little pieces of my cheek uh, wow. in there. And at microscopically, you know, all skin sheds. So when you eat, all you're eating yourself mm. like, all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, uh, but in, in that, so right there is a rod-like bacteria for example. And, you know, some of this, you can also know that uh, there's also Brownian motion at this scale. Uh, mm -hmm. But at that same time, I can tell that when they are doing different things in the same location, uh, and it's coherent, and, you know, when we are moving, for example, it's, so that's interesting. Uh, that's got to be probably something I ate. Uh, but it looks like microplastic to me, mm -hmm. which oh, would not be plastic. surprising, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it should not be that surprising, right? Uh, surrounded by it. So let's find other regions. Can we turn up the brightness? Yes. So you want to train the, the machine learning to find something interesting or some specific bacteria something? Yeah, I think we do this uh, for TB. We do that for bacteria. I'm going to mount the set of a sample for uh, for uh, malaria. There's very something very specific that we for. You know, these cheek swabs I haven't done in the past. I was just initially I was just curious whether you know what clinical information might actually be here, and the bacterial load might be a pretty interesting one to begin with. Uh, bacteria from your saliva, though, right? They are just on our mouth. They're everywhere. Like, you know, no part of our body is without bacteria. I mean, this is a cliche, but if you, now some of you have not heard it, there are more bacterial cells that define you than your own cells. Just total number of bacteria. Uh, but kind of what's fun is how accessible this assay is in some sense. Uh, and so, you know, I think if you guys haven't been using your full scopes, try doing this with a full scope and get a data set of your own bacteria. Uh, because uh, this you can literally also do with full scope too. How much better is the resolution? No, that just depends on uh, what you're trying to see. So, for example, this NA, the NA of this objective. So, the way you tell uh, objectives is you can see what does it say? It says you plan. Uh, 20x and then 0 0.5. So that's the NA of that objective. 
The NA of the objective that's in full scope is 0.2. And all that tells you is just the percentage of light that it collects. Uh, some of the objectives that cost around the single objective that would cost $10,000 would be an NA of one. Mm -hmm. This objective here is, I would say, maybe $100. And the objective in full scope by definition is less than a dollar. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the gradient to think mm -hmm. about. But if you care about just observing bacteria, the resolution of the full scope is 0.7 nanometers. The resolution of this objective might be down to 0.3 nanometers. I mean, then you are in the wavelength of light itself. Uh, but yeah, 0.7 is sufficient for you to observe and see bacteria. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna now try, uh, actually, why don't we do fluorescence to just check for a second whether there is any autofluorescence in there. So we haven't put a stain, so technically it should not be, and again, you know, these are many of the wavelengths, that's not the one that's in here. So I'm gonna try to see whether, Okay, so that's all autofluorescence. Wow. So you can see the 405 nanometer light and uh, that is actually really fun. So many of these things, there are compounds that, uh, so NADHP is one example. And the reason all of this is lighting up, especially in saliva, there is an oral cancer screen. Uh, we used to work quite a lot on oral cancer before, in which a fluorophore is made by healthy epithelium. And so the current protocols are, is if you ever go to a dentist, he might shine UV light in your mouth to just check. This is a common thing that they should always do as a screen uh, because healthy epithelium should autofluoresce, but cancerous lesions don't. And so if you see a dark spot, that's a good sign. At that point, they should take a biopsy and then you should go see a doctor. Lots of young people, like even people that don't smoke or anything, uh, the incidence of oral cancer are rising. People don't know why. Uh, but one of the things is that it's associated with this natural property of uh, the epithelium. Uh, and I think yeah, the, the compound is called NADPH or something. And it's very interesting that there's a lot more fibrous material in my mouth. I didn't have, I mean, I did have hot chocolate today, but I did. You put in the, with your uh, t-shirt. Yeah, it could be a little bit of that too. Yeah, you're right. Some of the fibers could just be from our t-shirts and other could things. Could be something like from your fingers. Yeah, it could also be that. This is clearly not a, a, a very well controlled experiment. Okay, so let's switch to blood. So I'm gonna have you just hold it for a second. Uh, and this is contaminated. Oh, okay. uh, what happened? Just wanted to yeah. rotate the chain. You know. uh, so these are just slides made with inkwell for testing. They're also not labeled, uh, I can tell. And it's interesting. Yeah, it's, so um, the if you're imaging and doing microscopy, always remember which side your sample is. So it kind of looks very similar to that, but if you look very hard, you can tell that this oh. is where the sample is, yeah. right? So, you know, just a huge issue normally in uh, just microscopy is if I mount that the other way, I won't have a uh, reward. You know, it can't focus through the slide. So I'm just going to go back here, live, and then there. And then, of course, any sample I put in, I have to focus it again. And then this is the one, uh, the new version of the software just automatically does that. So now that's blood smear. So I'll let you guys, if you want to come close. Uh, and then we'll try looking for all kinds of fun blood cells. So this roughly is around uh, six microns, seven microns. So, but now the challenge is, you know, this is just a tiny field of view. I can go as far as I want and you mm -hmm. see all kinds of just, it's a sea of cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you have to do is you just, if you were manually a microscopist, right? You were sitting 
you would see this much of a field of view and you have this massive sea to spend time on to be able to make kind of uh uh and this is really funny the ghosting it's almost mm. as if those are cells that lysed somehow mm. it's i'm a little bit surprised Why aren't they red they are a tinge red yeah, but that's all there is i don't know if I was it's like the pile of no there is a tinge of red that's hemoglobin that's where the red color on the thing but you're you're looking at the light remember color of anything is just dependent on its interaction with light and it's so thin it's only three microns high although it's seven microns wide and so that color is just coming from a tiny amount of absorption and then the other thing you can notice, for example, some cells have these little spikes. Uh, so when malaria infects cells, uh, again, when you change blood and fix it with a, there's osmotic shocks, all these membranes, because these are just bags of membranes, they can change shape. Uh, so you can subtly see. And the thing that I wanted to show you guys is morphologically, oh, there is a white blood cell right there, right there. So you see that that cell is dramatically different than its neighbors uh, right there. And of course it's fixed, but there's no label on it, uh, but you can still tell right there. So that would be some kind of a white blood cell or another cell, some immune cell possibly. Uh, and again, you know, when, if this is not a label sample, so if I go in, fluorescence, unfortunately, you won't see anything, which is good because that, that I mean, a, there is no label here for DAPI, uh, but then um, there's nothing else that's also autofluorescing so that your background is actually very low. So at this point, and actually now this is the good stuff. It's funny why these feel a little more red. I think they're piled up a little bit. Uh, and you can also just see the quality of the smear changing. Mm -hmm. You see now this is too high a density to do single cell probably. So there was a region in which after that region it kind of piled up. And this is the big portion of kind of the role of inkwell is that the quality, if I'm going to make a determination of a disease from just all parts, the quality always should be the same. And there is something subtly different between these cells and the other ones. So let's switch to squid. And Ellie's going to give a quick, uh, is that a good time, Ellie? Yeah, or we're actually I... talking. Awesome. Okay. okay. So we'll come back. The, as I said before, squid and octopi internally have very similar parts. But what's exciting is now this is really modular. Anybody can build anything on top of it. And then the application that's running on this is for tracking. So there's a lot of organisms that are alive that move. And uh, I'm assuming, let's see what cell it is. Oh, that's beautiful. So that's the item. Which culture is this? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, so this is the Monterey one that I got three weeks ago. And, and something it's else that's really cool is there's, there's just, just colonies all over the place, like perfectly. That so is fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, maybe Ellie, you should describe where you got this from first. Okay, so I got this from Monterey. I don't know if anyone's been down there, but there's Fisherman's Wharf. There's like that really long pier. I went to the end of that, basically stuck a net over, got a bunch of water. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm studying an organism that we know lives there. And so they're not in the sample anymore because they, yeah, they dissolve really quickly. They have strontium shells, which have dissolved really quickly in seawater. But there's obviously other things that are still alive. And there's this other thing that we can look for called these biosis of colonies, which are actually the symbiosis and so on. So that's cool that they're still in this they're still in this culture. Um, but this is a diatom that is alive. And so we can show you if we could stop tracking, you can see like this is just what we would look like, like what we're watching. You can see it's and very soon like, it will go out of your field of view. So if I want to study how the yeah. cell divides, I need to be watching and it for 12 hours. The way we more. used to do this is I would like go like this and, and then as it moves, I would you know continue following it, trying to keep it in the center of the screen. Um, but with you know software, you can see here, once it gets into the field of view, the little box and I click start tracking. Now the software is going to sit in the center of the, the window. This is like a video game that we are building because many of these instruments now we are putting them online. So you'll be able to log in into a website 
let's say, log in and to give me control of squid number 24, because we're putting them as a farm, and then choose a given cell, be able to interact with it, collect data, because one of the key things about these data sets in our environmental context, none of these data sets ever exist, because there are very few cells that you can actually grow in the lab. And so less than 1% of even stuff that people have tried can grow in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the other parts of this is just the instruments shouldn't be just sitting there. They can just operate and run. Um, so you can go get dinner, coffee, mm -hmm. you back and you have a beautiful uh, data set. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, one of the, the big threads here is the, just like single cell uh, transcriptomics and genomics is changing how we understand that every cell is unique and different. And we have to understand that. Uh, there's a lot of sets of assays. So for example, for diatoms alone, the best that we know so far would be satellite pictures of just chlorophyll in the water. And from that, the majority of that is diatoms and we kind of try to build maps of what's happening. While on the other extreme is literally, this is also one of those diatoms that was contributing to that satellite signal. But now this is the microscopic view. Like, can we observe and watch? We don't even know it's division time, right? So it's possible that now if this, we keep it running, this is robust enough that in the next five, 10 hours, it will actually divide. So then we would know for the very first time what the cell cycle of these sets of systems even look like. Uh, let's go around and find, uh, uh, or just all kinds of other cells. So you see that those controllers are actually designed around video games. We have a little trigger button on top. Uh, and something that's and then, really nice is we have different objectives on this. I was playing around. Yeah, let's just search yeah. for the it's other It's also a good one. test that you can play into the... What do the triggers do? The trigger locks to start tracking. Mm -hmm. So this is running essentially very much an open CV platform that was all first built for autonomous cars. So we're using the same tracking algorithms that are tracking you when you come in front of a self-driving okay. car. Is... You know that box that appears and they've gotten better and better. And only because of that, this we can do this. These are places just calling. Oh, those are big. Yeah, they're on. They're all over the dish. Looks like you're shooting on the uh, quadru quadricopter, no? And I got 3D data sets of these. On the yeah, here. I think we should definitely just also. These uh, of these. Yeah, but the other thing that we should just oh, do you can see is have this membrane with around. and without theocystis in our carrying yeah. data. Yeah. Because because uh, we have some empty shells that are sinking. Yeah, oh, wow. and also so you, the and you can see there's like a like a membrane around the theocystis colony. Do you see that? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, right there. And so then you can think about in terms of the types of data sets. If so, I'm going back again to soup screen. Uh, what would this do is that would be a prescribed assay because we're not actually tracking anything. You would say, I have 96 wells, here are the positions for it. You would write a little, just like in that multi-acquisition that this is the acquisition you want. You would remove the plate, add chemicals to that, start that in the end, do a comparison between with and without, and then just purely see abundance of bacteria to say, hour one, how many bacteria do I see? Hour two, how many, some of those colonies will grow but not in colonies, but in single cell. And then some of them would shrink. And then you will draw an AST plot, which just shows as a function of combinatorics of drugs and pathogens, what did every well do? So that would be kind of the goal uh, in terms of, and that would require you to quantify. So all of this data comes in, but unless you can process this autonomously using compute, it's very hard to infer what just happened. So. For example, for uh, Octopi, we have a spot detector that basically counts. And there's another tool called cell pose that also counts different types of cells. You can train for what cell type. So you would train them on bacteria and then it would automatically detect and give you just the total number of bacteria that you saw. So mm -hmm. the direction that science is just generally moving in life sciences, at least. In the old days, people would observe and see but now we can increase our observation window, but it's not possible to see all of our data. So this is what we struggled with, is that, so when Ellie got back from Antarctica, we still have to go through all the data. It's just, it's such massive amount of data, but algorithms can go through that data. But you can also miss out a lot because 
algorithms only see what you train them to see. So this is a huge challenge, although we're making this capacity open. And this is also why we're also opening these data sets because this is where citizens can engage and involve. You know, if somebody could highlight and upvote something interesting happened in this movie, and then suddenly it can actually be analyzed much more properly. Uh, but you know, these sets of data sets, for example, for abundance, uh, same is true also for planktoscope. Mm -hmm. It would be the flow through version of this. We have this massive amount of data, but then you, so you need to, if any of you think about these fields, you have to get your skills of processing data with code mm -hmm. to be really good, imaging data especially, because without that, it's so hard uh, to be able to say the kinds of things that you might want to say. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Why is the objective for under the... Uh, so this is inverted microscopes. Inverted microscopes are very valuable when you want full access from the top. Like I might, you can see it's an open top. So it's fully, I mean, that could be a massive amount of fluid on top. Mm -hmm. I might put other probes on the top. I might add mm -hmm. chemicals. Mm -hmm. So there are configurations. So when you buy microscopes, the microscope dealers would start with, I mean, uh, nothing bad against the dealers, but <laughs> they would start with, you want an upright microscope or an inverted microscope? And my answer is I want both. And so they will sell you two, two microscopes. Uh -huh. While in squid, all I do is, <laughs> I'm not going to do it here, but I undo the screw. Uh -huh. I flip this upside down. I mean, it's the same uh -huh. thing. It's an upright microscope, uh -huh. right? so it doesn't mean anything. But there is no modularity. There's no reconfigurability in how you buy instruments. Uh, and again, you know, for malaria, we're not really live imaging there. So then it actually helps to have an upright microscope because in the end, but it could have also been on the, that's just a choice we made because the stages are heavy. We wanted the instrument to be bottom heavy. But then otherwise, uh, we would have had to have this top heavy, which, uh, you know, most of these inverted scopes are top heavy. Uh, but this opens up for, you want to do electrical recordings, you might have neurons there and you have probes coming in. You could just design all kinds of things, capillaries to be able to pull something. Uh, and then I think the other part of this is... Uh, for some of those, I mean, this one happens to have a turret, so you can do multiple objectives. You can remove that turret, you can just mount one objective. You can take that same, completely remove that single arm, because you can see this is just transmitted light. It doesn't have fluorescence. But take that module and snap that here, and then suddenly this has fluorescence. So that's the reconfigurability. Uh, and again, you know, just, uh, Traditionally, this is really at the core. I mean, I'm assuming you guys have seen the big Nikon or any of those microscopes. It's just this is what there is, but it's all hidden in this box and you can't change it. And all the APIs are closed. And we pay five thousand dollars per year for software and blah blah blah. Actually, more. We pay ten thousand dollars for the Nikon. Yes, yeah. It's just insane. For the No, for one microscope. We pay uh, ranging from two hundred thousand to half a million dollars. We build squids for around three thousand dollars, and that's kind of the whole point. I'm happy paying for the objective. Yeah. You know, the objective has thirty-five different lenses in it. It's assembled in a very precise way. I mean, that's but to pay for motor control and cameras, and I mean, you know, we did a one-to-one -one comparison to show that the twenty thousand dollar scientific CMOS, they call or scientific CCDs, are equivalent now to the CMOS from the security cameras. Uh -huh. Because uh -huh. security people want to see in the darkest of night, like some little thing. And so they've improved their sensors at this point. And there is a mass application for it. While the scientific CMOS, there's just very few people in science and they couldn't catch up. And so, you know, like that tiny little camera literally does more than what I've paid in the last couple of years for $20,000 Hamamatsu cameras. And so I think this is the problem. But if you don't know it, you just follow what everybody else does, but you have to know it. And this is why you cannot be using scientific instruments blind. Like anytime you touch an instrument, you need to know ins and outs of it because you could both improve it, you could understand it, 
I mean, rheometry is the same way right now, I feel. Like rheometry is cost so much because people don't know what's going on inside it. You could change that. How much does it cost to build like a more traditional microscope? What does like, that mean more traditional? That you find and say like, like a high like a high school lab today. Oh, with a dissection scope? Yeah. Like adjusting for Yeah, I mean, I think there is, it's always a gradient as a function. So, you know, until full scope existed, nobody would say that you could make a microscope for a dollar, but then when you do it, and it's like, okay, it's done. So I would say <laughs> it costs a dollar, <laughs> but that's only because we did it. Uh, a traditional dissection scope currently in the market costs roughly around $10,000, unfortunately. So wow. the types of stuff in high schools that you guys were using was roughly 10K. Mm -hmm. wow. But that, does it need to be that much? No, and of course, most of the time, I don't know how much access you guys had to microscopes in high schools. Most of the high schools I go, people have looked at it a couple of times, Maybe when they had their one exam and that's it, but you don't play with those things. So mm -hmm. the, the idea is to be able, and again, now when you think about the pharma industry, like the analogy for doing drug screening on this platform, the entities that are the customers for somebody who would be making a drug screen platform, they're willing to pay half a million dollars. Like no artists would pay as much money as they have because they have plenty of money. They, they, they just want something that just works out of the box. So there's so much margin there. But on the other hand, then if only the entities like Novartis can run these types of things, then they will only focus on diseases that they think there is a market. Mm. While there's tons of stuff where people, I mean, market and people shouldn't add up. I mean, what does that mean? If, if there are people that are sick, that means that needs to be discovered and uncovered. And so this is where that it's the, the idea of the costs of most things is absolutely arbitrary. Mm -hmm. It's just driven by many other factors that have nothing to do with technology mm -hmm. or what you can actually do. And so I think this is sort of where you guys come in uh, because unless you ask that question, you cannot actually, uh, yeah, it's, it's not really, it's not really clear to say. And again, on the other hand, it's also valuable to do things in a sustainable manner. Many open source projects struggle because it's the one or two people that are maintaining those things. I mean, I've been guilty of, I use Ubuntu all the time. I've never paid a dime to the Ubuntu programmers and they, they are all basically working blue jobs late at night. And so in some sense, there is that notion of sustainability that has to be built in. Most scientific software that you guys use currently is just supported by one or two people off their off time. And this is a huge issue because if we can't support people to build uh, sustainable businesses around these types of frameworks, then if they can't support themselves, then the project dies. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part of this. And again, I mean, this is also true for Foldscope, is uh, we, if we ship it at a price that it cost us, it's been pretty hard to keep that entity afloat mm -hmm. because, you know, and people just take it for granted. So there is, uh, this is the, I think this is also where kind of from a, uh, building impact-driven entities that will evaluate themselves, not just by the end, but just number of people you've reached, but then making sure that it remains sustainable to a point that at least the entity will survive and can compete with all these other things that are, you know, like competing with the Nikons of the world is not so easy yeah. because mm -hmm. the marketing power and other things that they have is very different. Uh, and this is why I was saying that any of you think about contributing to open source projects because you are using it as a learning exercise, but you might actually like, for example, what we'll build for SoupStream will be another module available for the Squid community. Anybody should be able, that's kind of a benchmark that if you use ever an open source tools, you should lift it up and build something that at least somebody else can do now with that tool that they couldn't do before. So, you know, if uh, you guys take that as an example of swap this uh, computer with a cell phone, and that's a huge bump in that, that like eventually everything, like this is a huge cost right now. This is like $900. If we can shave that off by a $200, $300 cell phone, that would be awesome. And you saw that picture I sent yeah. you. It was a really funny picture that Apple had filed a patent uh, for 
uh, kind of a shell of a laptop in which where your trackpad is, you drop your iPhone and then you're <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, and it's exactly what Verm and folks are working on in Samir, that it's just, you know, we need to open up a cell phone for much broader use. Uh, so I think it, it's, I would be excited if we, we just make a little shell of a iPhone or any phone and it becomes a Raspberry Pi, like from the outside. It just gives all the ports, everything I can run whatever I want. And that would be a pretty sweet end result. You just say this is a shell. Because when it's a shell, then it's not the one project, then it's infinite number of projects. And I don't think I've seen it. I haven't as yet. Uh, there hasn't been, I think, any effort on thinking like that. And this is also why I kind of like the the fact that in the project name you guys use Pi, right? At least cycle Pi. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a, the shell should make and look and feel like Raspberry. Well, I just wanted to like see. Are there any ciliates? There was something like I don't know. Oh, right there is a ciliate. Yeah, zoom in. Okay, let me track it. Yeah. It's oh yeah, this is. So let's zoom in for a second. This could be a Saturnian, actually. Well, the rest is just not the best. Is it's that a forty X? Yeah. Do you want? I can give you a sixty X. Let me yeah. see if which objective. Um, yeah, if you remove the tracking, let's just watch it for a second. I think we got. Uh, so you can see that cell, and what is surprising and exciting is that it has appendages coming out of it, like as if it has barbed wire yeah. somebody <laughs> has poked in. Uh, and, uh, and I can also see something where, oh, this is this marine snow swimming by. You can also see some of that is also beating. There's a little bit of that frequency. Yeah, let's just watch it for a second. I am actually curious whether that's a sectorian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, they are oscillating. Yeah. But it's not swimming. That's kind of the surprise. So it somehow no, anchored itself to the surface. There's a little face with two eyes and nose and mouth. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> Long head. <laughs> this tilted. Now I can't unsee it. <laughs> I won't <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> You know, all of those will change. It's obviously talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah! Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Maybe we try. Yeah, I think it's a ciliate. Yeah, yeah. It's like the, that, that was very similar to what the, our, the jumping on the, the no, also the prey for Lockheed, the cold Texas that we use, which sits there and then runs away. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you feed it with something? Like a, <laughs> if we had something, something, yeah. Because these ciliates like go at it. Like they'll but there's attack each other. Thing. That's kind of also yeah. the point of observing natural ecosystems. It's kind of like a live Tamagotchi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <it's all> <laughs> yeah, there's like time of everybody eating each other. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's how these ecosystems are stable. Right? Um, okay, so I think what time is it? Um, oh, shit. We'll be there in 10 minutes. Uh, I have to go somewhere. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, can you guys bring the stuff back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll give this to group. Okay. Why don't you give this to me and group me? I'll take right. that. Drama, I I'm going to say bye to people. Uh,